Hello, cruel world. My name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant, forensic psychiatrist, and I live and work in London. I assess mentally disordered offenders so you don't have to. This is the third and final episode in a series that I've done about malingering. So that's when defendants or sentenced prisoners fake mental illness. In my first episode, I use my experience to explain why defendants on trial and prisoners fake and fabricate mental illness. And I also told you about a case where I believed that a man who'd been charged with multiple burglaries had actually done this and I exposed this man in the evidence I gave to court. In the second episode I told you about the tactics that I use to spot when this is happening and how I can weed this out and I also told you about another real-life case where I'm pretty sure a con artist got away with exaggerating mental illness despite the evidence I gave against her so go check those two episodes out. This episode is the third and final one in the series and I'm going to tell you about a case where I think I was duped and I later found out that a patient had fooled me and also also a kind of reverse case where somebody who I think was floridly psychotic when he committed his offence, which was arson, tried to fabricate his story to make him look sane, even though it ultimately hurt his case. I'm also going to tell you why I can never overtly call a defendant a liar and the terminology that I use instead in the formal evidence that I give to court. So welcome to A Psych for Sore Minds. Have you got an interest in true crime? What about mental illness? Why not both? Welcome to A Psych for Sore Minds, the only YouTube channel that I'm aware of that addresses the crossroads of the two. I'm your host, Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist and I assess and rehabilitate mentally disordered offenders or what the tabloids might call the criminally insane. And I do this in prisons and in courts and in secure psychiatric units. And I also act as an expert witness to advise judges in criminal courts across the UK. This channel that you're watching dissects a whole range of mental health topics, some of which are related to mental illness and violence like this one and some which are a bit more familiar should we say to the average person including occasionally interviewing people who've got real life experience of dealing with serious mental illness so there's something for everybody on this channel sit back and enjoy and welcome Okay, so I'd like to start off by telling you about a case where I was hoodwinked. It's a great word, hoodwinked. Not, not used enough, I think. I was basically fooled into believing somebody was unwell. I was the hoodwinky, and the hoodwinker was a young lady called Miss L, and her case was exceptionally complex. Her life story was chaotic and tragic. She had social services intervention as a child. She had an alcoholic mother, and unfortunately she bounced around foster care when she was a child. There were rumors that she'd been sexually abused by her stepbrother, though this was never actually proven or formally investigated. Miss L had a litany of offenses by the time I saw her when she was in her mid twenties. And these were mostly related to buying drugs, you know, things like possession, shoplifting. And she'd had numerous mental health act assessments. And that's when people were worried that she might be so ill that she potentially could need to go to hospital. So this is where somebody calls an independent psychiatrist and also a senior social worker. And most of these assessments led to the conclusion that she was not ill enough for hospital. But occasionally she did end up going to hospital. And when she did, almost every time after some observation, the psychiatrist thought that her symptoms were inconsistent. They thought that she was malingering and she was eventually discharged. There was a lot of inconsistencies and odd behaviors over the years. So when Miss L did actually engage in psychiatric services, she wouldn't turn up for appointments on time. And when she did, she was aggressive. She was uncooperative generally. So a good example of this was I saw written in her notes during one presentation to accident and emergency. She was like cowering in the corner. She was agitated. She was claiming that she could hear voices and that she was seeing vampires. And she was one signature away from a junior doctor prescribing her Valium, which is diazepam, which is a sedative which gives you a buzz. But then what happened is that a more senior doctor interrupted. And this person knew Miss L's previous shenanigans and he stopped this. And straight away, Miss L changed in her countenance. She went from being timid and scared to angry and demanding. She kicked off she smashed the window and then she was thrown out of A&E by a security guard. Miss L eventually got
got a diagnosis of unstable personality disorder, AKA borderline personality disorder. I've spoken about this at length in a previous episode, go check it out. But crucially, Miss L didn't have a formal diagnosis of a psychotic mental illness. So when I saw her, I was working in a female prison and Miss L was serving yet another sentence for theft. It was a four pound bottle of wine for Morrison's, if I remember correctly. A security guard had intervened and tried to stop her and she punched this man in the face. So even though I'm sure the security guard wanted justice and he has every right and he obviously can't go around just punching people. I also kind of, I felt sorry for Miss L and I just thought that these repeated short prison sentences were certainly not helping kind of break her cycle of offending. I thought she needed drug and alcohol, rehabilitation, community mental health team follow-up, psychology, social services. But as I said, it was really hard because she just wasn't engaging. I suspect that life in prison was slightly more stable and more boundary for Miss L than her life outside, which is why she either wanted to get caught or she didn't care. Even the hardest right-wing person has to admit that this is a very tragic set of circumstances. So I assessed Miss L a couple of times on the prison wings and she would just tell me to leave her alone. Obviously she would use more colorful language than that, but I'm trying to save the sensitivities of your ears, dear viewers. Her interactions with me were bizarre. They weren't obviously psychotic, but they were just kind of strange. Like for example, she would argue with me relentlessly about what the date was and she wouldn't allow the conversation to get past that. So she wouldn't speak about anything else. And there was some other odd, seemingly sort of rebellious behavior from her. So she would refuse to shower, which again, didn't quite directly indicate psychosis to me, but it made me very unsure about what was going on. So a couple of weeks into her sentence, she was taken to the segregation unit in the prison, which is a bit like solitary confinement. And that was because she started a fight with another prisoner and then she spat at a prison officer. So Miss L's challenging behavior continued in segregation. She was extremely agitated. She was like constantly shouting, banging on the door. She was ringing her prison buzzer. But yet when the prison officers arrived at her cell to ask her what she wanted, she would either completely ignore them despite the fact she'd been ringing or she would demand objects that she knew for a fact she was not allowed in the segregation unit. So her actions just generally didn't make sense. And unfortunately over the space of a few weeks her shouting became more frequent she became more agitated she was kind of animalistic and guttural in her shouting it was really not pleasant to witness and then she stopped showering altogether and she started throwing food around her cell when I assessed her she was actually on a two-man unlock which means that she was deemed so high risk that she had to have two prison officers present just to unlock her cell and then when I saw her in these conditions she would she would whisper her answers making me sort of lean in and I was convinced that she was at least doing this on purpose considering that she was so loud at all other times. So I managed to move her to the healthcare unit, which is like a psychiatric ward inside the prison. And the advantage of this is that there's more nurses there and there most of the time there's visiting forensic psychiatrists like me. And this took some convincing because the prison officers wanted to punish her because of her behavior and because she spat at one of their brethren. And then once she got to the healthcare unit, her Miss L's behavior further deteriorated to the point that she was constantly shouting, constantly banging on the door, and she wasn't really making much sense. And remarkably, she got to the stage where she was sleeping about one hour a night and literally yelling and banging for 23 hours a day. She also started smearing feces all over her room, which was like a form of a dirty protest. These kinds of dirty protests actually happen quite commonly in the world of forensic psychiatry. They happen in prison and they happen in seclusion rooms, which are like locked padded cells in psychiatric wards for the most agitated and violent patients. I wouldn't say it was common, but I've seen it maybe seven or eight times in my career, but I would say one is enough. I suppose if you're locked up and you have literally no possessions, no items, then a dirty protest is one of the only ways of kind of lashing out, attacking and massively inconveniencing the staff and basically disgusting the staff. There's lots of psychodynamic processes to explain there, and I'm sure Freud would have a field day. I might one day do a Psych for Sore Minds episode exploring this, and I'll tell you about the dirty process I've seen. So with Miss L, I spoke to some other clinicians who worked in the prison who knew her well, who'd worked there longer than me, and they knew her from previous prison sentences. And they told me categorically that Miss L would often act out bizarrely, she would fake mental illness, she would try to be transferred to a psychiatric hospital. And I think this is because she got to stay in hospital longer and there was more support leaving hospital than after leaving prison. So you can get a social worker to help you with your accommodation, drug and alcohol rehabilitation, even if she did eventually self-sabotage those things in the community. And these things uh, very sadly don't happen with short prison sentences because the system is so slow that things like this can't be sorted out in a few weeks. And I think that's a big, big problem and is an area that's lacking within our prison healthcare system, but that's a whole different episode. However, in my opinion, this didn't seem to be relevant to Miss L's presentation 
emotion when I saw her because she didn't seem to have an agenda. She didn't seem to want to go to hospital. When I mentioned it, she was indifferent about hospital in our conversations. Also, I prescribed her antipsychotic medication, which she did take, but she seemed indifferent to it. So for example, unfortunately, there are a couple of times where she missed a dose because of the handover of the nurses and she didn't even mention this or complain. So it didn't feel like she had this agenda for more medication. So what was a game? If it wasn't hospital, if it wasn't medication, I just could not figure Miss L out. And then one day we were suddenly told after a court hearing that she was about to be released from prison in two days. And this happens fairly frequent in prison due to charges being dropped or short sentences being given and then the prisoners already served some time on remand. And I was really worried about Miss L, a woman who was screaming and shouting 23 hours a day. Surely she couldn't just be let out into the community, right? I thought she was very unsafe. I thought she was vulnerable. So I spoke to my colleagues again and again, they insisted that she would be fine when she was released. So I thought about this for a while and against all advice of my colleagues, I arranged a mental health act assessment. So an independent doctor and a senior social worker had to come out and meet Miss L on the day she was released from prison at the gates of the prison. And I realized that if I'd got this wrong, it would be kind of embarrassing because there was a lot of strong evidence that indicated that she wasn't mentally unwell and that she was malingering, including very recent Mental Health Act assessments in the weeks before she went to prison. And everybody said she wasn't ill. So it was a big step for me to do that. So what happened? It turned out exactly what I'd been warned about would happen. So Miss L transformed into being absolutely fine on the day of her release. She apparently had a normal, appropriate conversation with the other social worker and the other doctor and told them her appropriate plans in the community. So I wasn't actually there because it happened to be one of the days that I wasn't working in the prison, I was working in a court. And this doctor and this social worker didn't say anything, but I imagine they must have been a bit frustrated and annoyed that they were called out to see this woman who apparently was fine. I have to say, I did get a gentle ribbing from my colleagues over the next few days, but I can take it. I still, to this day, don't really know what Miss L's motivation was. I mean, maybe she she was wanting to go to hospital, but she was double bluffing me by not seeming interested when I mentioned it. So maybe the whole game was just trying to fool me. And in that case, she certainly did. But I would also argue that I didn't have to live in a small room for many weeks that was covered in my own feces on the wall. So maybe I actually won that one. I have to say overall, it was a bit embarrassing, but I've learned to live with it. Another interesting facet of my job that I would love to share with you is how I comment on inconsistencies in the evidence that I give, both in my written court reports and also when I go on the witness stand. So I never call a defendant a liar, even if their pants were literally on fire. This is unfair and it might give preconceptions to the jury. So just because somebody lied about their depression doesn't mean that they lied about their alibi. So it's only right that they get a fair trial. So I have to choose my words very carefully. I might say there was an inconsistency consistency in Mr. X's reported symptoms versus objective available evidence. Or I might say there is no psychiatric reason with the reported symptoms would prevent Mr. X from understanding the consequences of his actions during the alleged assault. So I'm not directly calling them a liar. And also I always use the word alleged because I can't say whether they're guilty or not. In fact, I'm absolutely not allowed to comment on whether I think somebody's guilty or whether I believe the defendant's version of events about their offense. Unsurprisingly, many defendants who I assess completely deny their offenses or I think they fabricate the circumstances to reduce their culpability. Why wouldn't you? They often have an external locus of control. So see my episode about criminality on this channel if you want to learn more about that. And sometimes the stories that they give me are just unbelievable. And I don't mean unbelievable as in amazing. I mean unbelievable as in I don't believe you. So as an expert, I can't comment on this. If I did comment on what I believed or not, then I could be shredded by a judge or I could be cross-examined very aggressively by a barrister. Or even worse, they could say that I've overstepped my boundary as an expert and my entire evidence could be called under question and thrown out. And the judge would even have a right to make a complaint against me for the General Medical Council. And I've heard of this happening. I've never seen it or it's never happened to anybody that I personally know, but I know it's a possibility. Okay, we're gonna take a break and then I'm gonna tell you about a very unusual case. The cat 
So I'd like to tell you about a very unusual case. It's kind of the opposite of my other cases in that I suspect that a man who did have an experience of mental illness was trying to deny this in relation to his offence. So I saw a man in his 60s, Mr W, who had a prior diagnosis of bipolar affective disorder, which I've talked about in previous podcasts, and he committed arson. And I have to say it was a very sort of bizarre incident. He was caught by police after having started a small fire in front of a post office. And the whole event seemed very disorganized and confused and random. He'd stuffed some newspapers down his own trousers and he was sat outside the post office rambling to himself when the police came. And when the police did come, he made no effort to try and hide or to escape. During the police interview, Mr. W expressed some really bizarre ideas such as that he'd had supernatural powers. And he also consistently gave this bizarre story about a man on a unicycle who apparently had just appeared out of nowhere and started this fire. So he said this story to the police, he said it to his solicitor, and he said it to me when I interviewed him. What I found was really interesting when I assessed Mr W was that he massively minimised his mental health history. So I managed to get hold of his old notes which indicated this diagnosis and it also indicated that he'd been very unwell at many times and he also used illicit drugs including crack cocaine. And he'd also had five hospital admissions to psychiatric units all fairly recently. Mr W very much minimised all of this. So when I first asked him about his mental health history he said fine. It's only when I outlined what I'd read in the medical notes that he reluctantly accepted his previous hospital admissions. However, he had this tendency to very bizarrely deny or have explanations for his previous actions. So for example, at one point he was reported to be very manic. He was running down the streets, he was shouting at lampposts and he was topless and he was taken to accident emergency and then to hospital. So I asked him about this incident and he just tried to blow it off. He said it was a hot day and that's why he was topless. Another day he'd been picked up by police when he was reported, uh, he was rambling in a park and he was claiming that he was like the female incarnation of God. When I asked him about this, he said it was just a joke that had gotten out of hand. Mr W was also started a fire in a bin outside a police station and his excuse was that it was bonfire night, even though bonfire night was a couple of weeks afterwards. What's bizarre about this case is that I believe that on the balance of probabilities, there's a chance that he was actually psychotic at the time of the arson, given the odd circumstances and given his strange behavior. However, even though I did state this in the evidence, I couldn't really make the argument that he was less criminally culpable. I couldn't state this with any confidence because I was unable to explore his thought processes at the time, which I believe that he was hiding from me, even though I wasn't 100% sure. I still don't really understand Mr. W's motivations. I mean, I I suppose I could have been wrong. There could have been a random man on a unicycle, but it's highly unlikely. It could have been that he was completely insightless and genuinely doesn't remember any psychotic symptoms. But again, I'm not buying that he doesn't remember any of it. I suppose another explanation could be that he was so scared of returning to psychiatric hospital that he would rather just lie and go to prison. Although in my opinion, it would have been a better environment from him considering he was acutely unwell. And also he wouldn't even, even probably had to go to hospital because he wasn't unwell when I assessed him. And I explained this to him, but he didn't seem to have believed me. Had Mr. W been psychotic as I had suspected and had he been more open about this, then there's a chance he might have got a lesser sentence uh, due to mitigating circumstances. Circumstances. Just goes to show you should expect the unexpected in my line of work. So dear viewers, what do you think? Have you got any questions for me about Miss L or Mr. W? Any comments? Have you got any stories about when you think somebody has been lying to you, when the stories don't quite add up? So for my next episode of A Psych for Sore Minds, I'm actually not really sure what it's gonna be about. I've got lots of videos planned and I'm not sure what to do next. But if you wanna find out, you should subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'd really like you to subscribe. Not only does it help me out immeasurably, but it actually reduces air pollution. And I'd love some more comments and questions, so please get in touch. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have or enter any discussions about any mental health issues. Follow us on Instagram, please. Like our Facebook page and submit episode ideas or questions at our email address, which is psychforsoreminds at gmail.com. Until next time, stay euthymic homies, and remember, I love you.